Hello? Fine, fine. We'll be starting soon, so. Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Today we're having a session about small grants, big impact, investing in local climate action. So it's a pleasure to have this session here at the GCFGF Pavilion. This is a session that will be talking about the power of small grants. We hear about a lot of big monies here in the climate change um, summit, but um, what we really want to focus here is to make a difference. We really need to start from the local level, empower local communities, and really see what the local solution and innovation is, and nurture that and see what, how we can scale that up with partnerships, with private sector, government, and different actors together. But things start from the local level and here we have partners who have been working for many years on the ground supporting uh, the small grants initiative on climate solutions such as renewable energy increasing resilience working on adaptation initiatives and there is uh, different facilities that has been established to support local communities and we're more and more working together to amplify these impact and scale up and um, just to name a few the GEF the ICI small grants and maybe at later we'll have the World Bank um, DGM the direct grant mechanism and others who are working to support local communities and indigenous peoples in particular and we really want to just hear from each of the institution what you have been doing and how you have been scaling up these work and how you have been effectively working with local communities to empower and capacitize and sort of go to the next step in um, building up the local climate solutions. So, with no further ado, um, I would like to now get into the panel. And each of the panelists will be discussing first introduce themselves, uh, their names and what they do. And they will get involved more in terms of um, what, what kind of uh, activities they're doing. So with that, um, I'm very happy to introduce first um, Mr. to my right. Oh, you can't hear me? <laughs> OK. So the first uh, to my right is Mr. Apollinaire uh, Nandi. He is the Director General of the Fond National from Benin. So over to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, over to you from the left side. 
Um, thank you to invite me to this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, um, my name is Apolina Yanvi. I'm the General Director of Environment and Climate Fund of Benin. Um, Environment and Climate Fund of Benin is an um, accredited entity of a GCF and Adaptation Fund. Uh, that is a public uh, establishment of social and scientific uh, nature under the supervision of the Ministry of Living, uh, Environment and Sustainable Development. Um, its mission consists in mobilizing international green research and financing program and projects aimed at the protection and regional management of the environment, natural and forest research, the fight against the harmful effect of climate change and the promotion of uh, sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Apollinier. So next to the right is Ms. Catalina. Maybe introduce yourself and what you do. Thanks. Oh. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me in this panel. Um, I'm Catalina Gonda. I'm Climate Policy Coordinator at uh, Fundación Ambiente y Recursos Naturales, FARN, uh, a small NGO based in Argentina, uh, who has um, more than 30 years of trajectory uh, in Argentina, and we cover most of the environmental agenda um, in the country, but also work um, with partners at the international level as well. Um, and our work is really rooted in uh, public participation, uh, access to information, um, and uh, we work also with lots of uh, communities and, and local communities and indigenous communities in the territory, but also um, at a national level trying to promote and advocate for uh, robust environmental uh, laws and institutions. Um, so. Apart from our work in climate change, of course, we work uh, with uh, biodiversity, uh, natural resources, mining, and many other issues. So I'm happy to be here and share some of our, of our work that we're doing uh, with the help of, of Iki. Thank you so much, Catalina. So now next to her is Miriam. Uh, Miriam from the German government. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, maybe. very good. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, also for inviting me and for having me on this panel. Uh, my name is Miriam Ott, and I work for the uh, German Foreign Office, um, which is now in charge of international climate policy as of this year. And I lead the team on bilateral climate cooperation, in which we also administer part of the funding for the International Climate Initiative, which has been existing since 2008 and which has uh, funded um, hundreds of projects with a total volume of 5 billion um, euros uh, since 2008. And um, with, with the incredible challenges that we're facing in, in uh, moving to this transformation forward in the, in the few years that we have left to really um, you know, change the current dynamics that we're having, the International Climate Initiative has also been moving towards funding bigger and more transformational uh, projects. And one thing we've been realizing on the way is that we must not forget the impact of the local, of the local level and of that with small grants we can have big impacts, which is why we started the ICI Small Grants Program in 2019, which funds uh, also two of the institutions uh, sitting on this panel. And I'm very excited to be here and also to hear um, the experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. Next to is uh, Filippo from GEF. Over to you. Thanks, Yoko. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So I'm Filippo Berardi. I'm the coordinator of the climate change focal area at the GEF. And so um, we have a very small team of colleagues. We uh, oversee the um, sort of preparation of the strategy uh, for each replenishment period. Um, and then we help and support the agencies and the country to present application for funding to the GEF uh, and, and make sure that they are in line with the directions that we get uh, from our donor as uh, part of the replenishment package. Uh, perhaps uh, some of you must have heard that we just completed our eighth 
replenishment period um, or the, the negotiation for the replenishment of the eight period of the GEF uh, with a record replenishment of uh, 5.3 billion for the next four years. Uh, there's an uh, um, increased envelope for uh, um, the SGP, so we're particularly happy to talk about that today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Filippo, for representing the GF and the big support to the small grants and many other projects. So now we'd like to uh, move on to Halad. Um, over to you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, the SGP, for the kind invitation. My name is Khalid Nubi. I'm the CEO of Nature Conservation. What? Voice? All right. My name is Khalid Nubi. I'm the CEO of uh, Nature Conservation Egypt. It's an Egyptian NGO uh, founded since uh, 2005. We work mainly in nature conservation around the country through science, advocacy, environmental education, and um, uh, raising awareness. Uh, we are a beneficiary of the small grant program, uh, and I'm here to share our experience on what went right, what could be improved, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, engage with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Halid. So today we will be hearing from the donors' perspective on what the program is like and then how they are expanding this uh, initiative uh, overall and what their focus is, is. And then we will be hearing from three of the grantees as well as national institution who is managing the small grants. And then we will open up for question and answers. Oh, we also have uh, Paul here, uh, Paul Hartman, who leads the Nature and People uh, program at the SIF, the Climate Investment uh, Facility. So we will be hearing from him as well later before the uh, qu uh, question and answers. But I hope uh, we will be having a very interactive session today and uh, hearing from different views and move on and expand this sort of small grant sort of mechanism moving forward. So first, Miriam, I'd like to pose a question regarding the German government is really increasing supports on climate you know, solutions and particularly working with local actors. And we'd like to hear from you, how is this community-based uh, approach can better be promoted and expanded and what kind of instruments you are employing to this field? Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, so as I mentioned, the ICI Small Grants program has only been in existence uh, since 2019. Uh, so it's still quite a new program and we're, we're um, continuing to learn lessons uh, from that. But um, as the International Climate Initiative as a whole, the ICI Small Grants are um, supporting projects in the fields of mitigation adaptation, but also forests and natural sinks and also biodiversity. And what we've been learning since 2019 is, first of all, that the demand for that kind of funding is huge. Um, we're, we're funding projects uh, the size of uh, 60,000 to 200,000 euros. And every year, we've been having calls for proposals. And every year, we've re been receiving about 10 times as many applications for projects as we've been able to fund. Um, so the demand is huge. and. Um, that's part of the reason why we doubled the funding available for this year's call, which will actually be launched at the end of this month. And uh, there'll be a side event in the uh, German Pavilion uh, tomorrow at 6.30, uh, where you'll get more information about this as well. Um, so we're doubling uh, the funding and, uh, and hoping for, for a lot of applications um, again this year. Um, one additional element that we have as part of the ICI Small Grants program is that GIZ, who's implementing the program for us, um, uh, is also um, offering capacity building to local organizations because uh, one key challenge, I think, for a lot of local organizations is um, accessing funding, um, not only ICI Small Grants, but also bigger volumes and to, to sort of um, getting sort of after working with ICI Small Grants, try getting to access uh, bigger uh, amounts of funding as well. Um, so th the capacity uh, component is also uh, part of ICI Small Grants. But then there is also a whole different um, element in ICI Small Grants, which is that we're also working with funding institutions in countries uh, at the national but also at the regional level, um, like uh, Monsieur Poulinaire's uh, institution. Um, and f for those funding institutions, we're offering up to 850,000 euros per institution and also offer um, c 
capacity building uh, for institutions to then administer their own small grants program in their country. Um, so, so then we can have more more um, impact at scale. And um, one thing, one thing I've been observing working on international um, climate finance implementation uh, for about ten years is that uh, there is a huge gap between the institutions that um, implement the billions, and we need those institutions as well, and the institutions working at the local level who know um, who know the local situations who know the local actors who really understand the problems and who I think also have the biggest ownership for the changes that we need because it's their livelihoods that are at stake and uh, I and I think programs like Iki small grants and the Jeff small grants can have a huge impact in in trying to close that gap and have institutions uh, work together and have small scale instit institutions also um, bring in their perspective thank you Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, hearing your story, there is so much synergy that I can see between the Small Grants Program and Nikki Small Grants because we are supporting in Small Grants Program up to $50,000 uh, project, but then your, your initiative is up from 60000 to 200000 and I think some of the successful cases can be well be replicated using your mechanism and have some sort of scale-up synergy there. And uh, having an institution in the national level, we can also have a local sort of national coordination on this initiative as well. So thank you so much. So now I'd like to move to uh, Filippo, who is representing GF. And um, we'd like to hear from you what the GF support, you know, to the communities and civil societies. And how do you see the further expansion of this work? And particularly, how do you see the strengthening of technical as well as institutional sort of sustainability and scale up through these programs and uh, how do you see the future so thank you very much Filippo okay um, well thanks for the thanks for the question yeah. um, we uh, we are the just like uh, the, the, the SGP for us really is um, not just one of the longest standing programs but also one that uh, sort of is one of the, the has the, the happiest phase uh, it, it really connect us with uh, the, the the ground level organizations, and it help us bridging that gap between top down support uh, through government with the bottom up action uh, that uh, the climate community, frankly, needs so desperately. Um, the the it it talks to the essence, I think, of uh, of uh, what sort of the generally sustainable de development means, uh, which is thinking global but acting uh, local. Um, we're very proud that the SGP has supported more than 27,000 grants in its 30 years of experience in 135 countries. And uh, uh, also proud of the uh, partnership that we've, have, we've had with, uh, with UN UNDP uh, to this regard. I think there's clearly uh, an opportunity, and, and I sit um, on the sort of uh, government public sector side of the climate change programming, and there's clearly an opportunity to further align our investment strategy with governments, with uh, the, the investment windows and generally the principles of SGPs to try and uh, facilitate uh, as much as possible scale up of ideas that are incubated and accelerated um, uh, through the community level interaction that the SGP funds. So I think we've, we've done some of this thinking and um, uh, the new SGP program uh, 2.0, which by the way is just been submitted for consideration to the council in, uh, in December, I believe includes some of the elements that really are gonna be helpful in that direction. So, First of all, um, and the Jeff CEO has been very clear on that, we are convinced that um, the, 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 the support of, uh, of uh, the support to developing countries need to kind of go beyond the national, in, the national central government level. So that one is the sort of first starting point consideration. And, um, and, and based on that, the envelope for SGP has increased for 128 from $128 million 
in Jeff 7 to 155 million. So I think it really is in itself a victory for non-state actors, civil society, women, um, um, indigenous people and the youth. Um, and by the way, there's an increased focus on the youth that we hope to be seeing uh, coming through with SGP 2.0. And really, the, the, the SGP 2.0 uh, is based on four uh, key pillars, which, again, we hope will go towards um, supporting an expansion of the impact on the ground of the program itself. The first is expanding the financial base, uh, enable greater scope and reach of the SGP, uh, and uh, ensure access to core funding for the, of the SGP to all eligible countries. So that's number one. The second is continue to innovate on the delivery models um, of the SGP program itself, um, uh, including two new initiatives. One squared on microfinance um, for MSMEs. Um, um, and, uh, and the second one will be organized around what we call a uh, civil society organization challenge program. And, and I think what's interesting about these two new programs of the SGP is that we've opened the possibility for every GEF agency to uh, be able to support applications um, to participate in these two programs. And we hope that these will bring um, innovation and a, and a sort of a, a, a breath of, of novelty uh, to the partnership itself. Um, and finally, the SGP 2.0 includes elements of optimization of the process itself, through which we hope that more of the funding that are made available to the GEF by donors eventually can flow directly to the local uh, organizations on the ground. So these are some of the um, sort of directives uh, that uh, the GEF has uh, pushed forward uh, to ensure that um, uh, the, the SGP has uh, sort of a continuous expansion and growth in the future uh, and eventually result in impact on the ground and goes back to my initial point which is uh, try as much as possible not just to sort of have a top-down approach through the central government when it comes to identify solution for climate for biodiversity but also as much as possible using the community-based bottom-up solution to inform uh, uh, the policies uh, um, that are able to eventually result in the transformational changes that we need to see if we are serious about uh, 1.5 degrees. Great, thank you so much. Okay. So thank you so much, Filippo. Um, great words. Um, as, as you mentioned, um, the 30% increase in SGP funding under GFA is really promising with 155 million. And you mentioned also about the sort of more integrated approach with a larger project. And we have quite a bit of experience with you know, managing a local community component of a full-size project or a medium-sized project. And uh, maybe some of you who are here also have those experiences of doing that. And we can integrate the Small Grants Program initiative with a larger initiative and we can do more of those. And finally, you mentioned about uh, uh, youth, uh, the focus. I'm very happy to introduce Noon, who is here. She is a grantee from, SGP grantee from Almania, and she just made it from the airport directly coming here. So Noon, just uh, maybe a few words of introducing yourself and what you do. Hello. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nune and um, I'm from Armenia. I'm the founder and the leader of the organization called Women in Climate and Energy, uh, which was founded to support uh, sustainable development by engaging youth and uh, women. And since opening 2018, we have uh, implemented a successful project, and now in Armenia, we are the leading organization in the sector. And it is an honor here to be here and uh, very close. Okay, okay. 
So it's an honor to be here and uh, exchange and uh, with the project, one of the successful one, which was founded, uh, funded by the uh, small grant program. And it is called Green Skills for Youth, uh, which was uh, aimed uh, of um, awareness raising and capacity building of uh, school children and teachers. The target was uh, were schools, school children and teachers, yes? And uh, about the climate change, uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation, it is, uh, sometimes it is really hard to understand when you are talking about climate change and it is connected with everything. And uh, in order to uh, explain it, you have to build this logical chain, yes? So it was very important to start from the schools and to kind of, um, yeah, uh, to, make, to, to make them interested in this. So uh, what we did, we gave some uh, green skills to these uh, children and also uh, teachers to uh, do this uh, energy assessment of their schools, yes? Why their schools? Because we wanted them to have the ownership, yes? This is their schools. So they did these uh, energy assessments and participated in the decision making with directors, with teachers, with communities, uh, and suggested some solutions. They competed with the 10 schools, different schools, with their solutions, and some of them, uh, they, um, five teams, they realized it, they implemented the uh, project and participated in it. So it was like project-based learning, but not only this, it was uh, coupled with uh, partnerships, with, um, um, uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, yeah, thank you, sorry. Yeah, thank you so much, Nune, and we'll come back to you again in hearing about the youth initiative and other things, but thank you, and thanks for making, making on time from the airport. So um, now we'd like to move to um, Apollinaire, actually, uh, who have been basically managing the small grants ICI program in the country level. And we'd like to particularly hear from you your perspective as a representative of a local funding institution. How do you do knowledge sharing, knowledge management, maybe South-South cooperation? Um, also, how do you develop the capacity of local communities um, hand-holding so that they can come up with uh, innovative solutions and test it out? And so over to you to share those knowledges and experiences. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, uh, local community are particularly vulnerable of uh, negative effect of the, uh, climate change uh, due to their dependence on uh, uh, natural research and uh, uh, the implication of uh, the potential implication that um, climate vulnerability have on the uh, life and the, the water uh, and the, the food security uh, and uh, vital infrastructure. Um, the approach uh, to addressing uh, advice effects of climate change uh, to the local community is to aim to um, build the capacity, build capacity and help them uh, as the local government to assess and use climate finance to uh, investment uh, adaptation and uh, to promote uh, development with integrated um, adaptation in local plan and uh, um, uh, contribute to determine, uh, uh, national contribute determine in the local uh, plan uh, 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 adaptation. And uh, it means that uh, um, climate financing opportunity must be uh, better disseminated um, 
into the local level. Uh, similarly, the capacity of municipal uh, official and technician should be strengthened in the term to access international climate windows. Thank you. No, I think uh, it's very clear from your intervention that uh, partnership with local and national government and making a policy change is also very important when you're doing a small grants initiative and also working with civil society and local communities very closely. So thank you so much for sharing that. So now we'd like to really move to our um, respective uh, grantees of IKI as well as from the SGP. And we're really excited to have three of you actually here from different uh, regions represented. Um, let me start from Katarina. So I'd like to hear from you, Katarina, as a civil society organization. What are the uh, sort of institutional approach that you take to make sure that uh, inclusive, innovative, and impactful initiative can be done with local communities? And how do you support capacity building, knowledge sharing, and other initiatives on the ground? So over to you. Thank you. And maybe just to give a bit of uh, context of what we're doing and who we're working with, um, our project um, has the objective to raise awareness about the importance of um, Indian wetlands, so the, this high mountain wetlands in the Andes, uh, in the context of climate change and biodiversity. And also, um, confronting the challenges that of uh, mining and lithium mining that is very um, uh, very rapidly growing in that region where this really fragile ecosystems exist. And these mining um, areas also overlap with uh, the ancestral territories of indigenous communities. So uh, we have been working uh, on raising uh, the awareness on the importance of these ecosystems for these communities, um, especially given that this region in the northern part of Argentina, in La Puna, uh, is one of the regions most vulnerable to climate change in Argentina. It's projected to um, be one of the areas in the world that will likely suffer uh, huge temperature increases in the next decades. And it's also a very dry region, um, so uh, there's already some um, some very uh, big problems regarding uh, water accessibility for these communities, and also lithium mining is very water intensive. So um, this is draining most of these wetlands, which are crucial for the survival of these communities and the la and, and the ways of life of these um, indigenous communities. So in that sense, um, local participation is one of the key uh, or the core axes of our work uh, for, for this uh, project. And we, are, we believe that this, this participation requires respectful, effective, and diverse engagement of these communities in the ground. And so we've been uh, really trying to provide this space for these communities to uh, engage with policymakers to engage with each other because we also um, acknowledge that um, part, uh, knowledge exchange between these communities is also very important. Um, and we've been uh, working in the ground, um, doing uh, wor organizing workshops uh, in Laguna Grande uh, with with these communities. Um, also inviting uh, different representatives from academia from uh, some policymakers as well. So we're really trying to build a space for these voices to be amplified. And also through our um, national work at the national level, with the, um, through this, um, all the, the political um, processes or the climate policy processes that are currently underway in Argentina, uh, we're really trying to also highlight um, the importance of um, having these voices uh, being brought into the conversation. And also because we think that this is crucial um, to, to really, or that, that bringing these voices in is really important in the context of uh, the debates on a just energy transition. Um, so I think 
in general, we, we have been mostly focused on creating these platforms for these communities and uh, really also raising awareness with some policymakers that are in Buenos Aires, really far away from these territories that are not being able to see their impacts or the, the impacts that uh, these activities are having in the ground and the importance of uh, also these fragile ecosystems for this very survival of, of these people. Um, so we're trying to, to highlight this also in our conversations that we're having in the capital. So um, that's a general overview of what we're doing. We've been doing this through, uh, as I mentioned, workshops, uh, through also engaging with um, organizations working in other countries, such, such, uh, such as Chile and Bolivia, which have which face similar problems. Um, so yeah, I can I can uh, I'm happy to to provide more details on this, but that that's the general overview of what we've been, we've been doing so far. Thank you so much, Katarina. It's very clear that uh, you have a strong sort of approach working on the ground with local communities, but not only that, but bring that voices to the policymaker and make sure that these climate negotiation and others, we hear from the indigenous, you know, sort of knowledge and experiences and have sort of a very integrated approach in terms of capacity building um, and uh, advocacy work integrated into the work. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, now I'd like to move then to Egypt, the very place we are here. Uh, Khaled has been leading a really great work on the ground and we'd like to hear what kind of approach you have been taking to empower local communities and strengthen their sort of outreach and work together. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yes. As, I'm, as an Egyptian, welcome to Egypt. We are glad to have you here. Uh, so first I would like to give you an insight on what kind of project we did with the small grant program. We could develop uh, a virtual reality glasses that when a person put it on, it takes you immediately to a protected area that is around Cairo. This was very, very useful because we could literally, after making those glasses, we could take the protected area to school kids who live maybe 1,000 kilometers away from the protected area to have a full experience. Not only this, but we have been using it very, very widely since when we want to get a decision uh, maker uh, on board or to get their attention, we work on nature conservation. We meet officials in their offices. It makes huge difference when we introduce ourselves by saying we take care of nature, we conserve nature, this one story, but we don't do this actually. We take the glasses with us, we ask the gentleman to put them on and they get immediately mesmerized, turned on immediately to our interest. So this is what we did. Uh, it's a it's very good project. I, I, uh, and by the way, we have it here. I would like to invite all of you to v visit us in the, in the green Zoom in our booth to try it. We have it. Uh, but if I want to move back to this point of the capacity building, this is very, very crucial for us as NGOs in Egypt, it always feels like uh, the small grant program, like the nearest fruit for us to pick if we have something in mind and if we have an urgent topic that we need to respond to. Uh, it's very encouraging program and also the focal point uh, uh, people who take care of this are very cooperative, they are encouraging and so on. But we do suffer from uh, lack of capacity building program. And when I say capacity building, I don't mean individual capacity building, but also institutional capacity building. I would love to see some fund or grants assigned or allocated for organization, not necessarily to deliver projects on the ground, but to develop their institution to make, in most of the cases, we need legal consultancy for some issue that we are stuck in and we cannot move as an NGO. We need uh, maybe accounting consultancy. We need an HR policy uh, to, to be developed in the place. And those are sustainable products. They will, if, if we could do this, it will empower the whole institution to run more. But the amount of fund allocated for such capacity is very, very limited. And we would like to see more on that. And also capacity building for individuals 
now in Egypt we are experiencing a huge demand on skillful uh, nature resources, uh, practitioners uh, and managers by the private sector. So the consultancy companies pay much, much more wages than wh what we could pay. So we end up in, in some cases hiring maybe not the most competent person, maybe not the most uh, well-educated person in this field. So we need bigger scale, national scale programs for capacity building. Uh, those things I would like really to see. And there's also, uh, also one more thing that I would like to uh, see improvement in, the issue of 50% contribution in, in the program. To get a, to get a 100,000, you need to contribute by cash of 50,000. This is really, really restricting a lot of small NGOs of participating. Most of NGOs on the ground in Egypt, they cannot afford 50% of what they need to receive. So I would like really you to reconsider this and to uh, evaluate it more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haled, for raising this really important issue. And actually, what we really recognize within the small grants sort of mechanism, and particularly with our program with small grants, is that to do small grants, it's not just giving grants to do things on the ground, but also the before that, we really require a capacity development, as you say, to develop the institution and individual and others to take care of these matters. And also, once you have the implementation done, to do a knowledge sharing and also learning from each other. And those are basically a really p a package in a way to make the small grant successful. And we need to consider those sort of components and costs embedded to make these programs successful and scale up actually, because if you're just implementing a program on the ground, it's a one-off thing, but to ensure sustainability, we do recognize those important sort of elements and trying to see that how we can expand those initiatives within a program. So thank you for raising that issue. Um, let me go back to Nune. I mean, it's so nice to have you here as a youth representative and I'm so, intrigued that you have a title of president and you know with your youth your youngness and having a president next to me is amazing and maybe you can talk a little bit more about your work with a school and the initiative that you mentioned how do you approach and what kind of effective approach that you have recognized moving forward and also how can we involve more youth to these type of facility and work together and your perspective on it sure Thank you very much. So, uh, how to involve youth? So, the, it was an issue for us because, okay, I, ch I will try to talk uh, with two microphones. <laughs> so, what I wanted to say, in order to uh, engage youth in this kind of project, we th thought about how to make it uh, attractive for them because youth, uh, they, they go uh, in the sectors that it is fun, they can uh, earn more money uh, to, to make the interest. We started to uh, build our uh, project in a way that they were learning and having fun. They, it, was, it was always like a game. So when playing, they were learning and they were wanting to go uh, further and further. So they were competing with each other. In the end, we had a community of green squads in 10 schools. It is more than 100 uh, school children that were uh, like a virus. They were just telling about what they have learned. And then it uh, grew from school to the community and from the community to the ministries. And uh, it was so successful that we tested, yes, uh, the pr with the project. It was innovative project. It was funded like an innovative project. We tested and uh, it succeeded. So uh, it was included in the policy. And now we are testing another thing uh, to make it more digital and accessible for every school children, not only 10. Uh, schools, school children, but for all school uh, schools, and uh, you know the issue was with the uh, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> so the issue was uh, it was a time of a COVID, yes, and we had a lot of awareness raising, capacity building, field visit, 
visits in order to accomplish this project, yes, uh, how it was designed. And then the COVID happened and everything went to digital uh, way. And it didn't, um, it helped us, it helped us to uh, construct this project even uh, more uh, successful. We created two platforms, platforms for uh, teachers, platform for school children, uh, and they could communicate with each other and ask questions. And as being um, a founder of this Women in Climate and Energy organization, I understand the um, power of um, power of the networking and sharing and talking and asking. So when you, we were creating these platforms, we gave to these even teachers uh, to have the opportunity to ask questions and receive an answer and then improve themselves, go further. So these, these partnerships uh, helped us a lot in succeeding this uh, project. And the youth, I told you, they like to play games. <laughs> and this sector has to be attractive to, for them, yeah. Okay, I don't know great. if I could answer to your question. No, but no, yeah, I think uh, you have really yeah. answered the question really well. I mean, in order to get involved in these kind of fields, it have to be fun, of course, and you have to be enjoying it with your friends and, you know, learn from each other. And the platform idea that you mentioned, I think, is excellent. And in many of the countries that we work with in small grants, too, we've been working with a youth association, youth network, and I, I, we feel that uh, that's a really important part that uh, you develop friendships and have fun together. And I think that's the essence of it. Okay. Yes. So this is great. And we really heard a really rich information from our panelists. But now it's your turn to basically participate and share your questions and comments. But before doing that, I really like to invite Paul Hartman here. Um, he's a good old friend. And we were just chatting about having this uh, small grants um, big impact initiative today at this panel. And he also manages a program uh, called uh, uh, Designate, Designated um, Grant Ma Me Mechanism, which is focusing on indigenous peoples and forest management. And so I thought it would be really enriching to hear his story, what you do, and what your focus is, and how you share sort of the similar experience here as well. So over to you, Paul. Uh, great. Thank you, uh, Yoko. And, um, I was on a panel last night with indigenous people and there was an 80 year old indigenous person from um, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and not only was he naturally more charismatic than me, but he also stood up. So I'm gonna stand up to give this, uh, this speech. Um, so the dedicated grant mechanism um, is part of a, a program of the Climate Investment Funds uh, where I work. Um, and we have a program called the Forest Investment Program um, which works in 13 countries. Um, the program has about $770 million um, for these countries. And as a part of that, each country carves out a specific amount where de indigenous people and local communities themselves will decide who and where they want to put the money. So indigenous people, local communities are part of a steering committee. That steering committee sets out the ground rules for granting and they give out some grants. Uh, so to date, there about, there's about $80 million in uh, financing that's gone out. Uh, that supported um, 600 subgrants. some of them as small as individuals. It just depends on what the country wants to do. Some of them up to $5 million, and it goes right to uh, IPLCs. Um, so I think, you know, as we think about uh, this push that's occurring right now to support um, civil society, to support local people in the management of our natural resources to support the forest, to support the biodiversity. Mechanisms like the dedicated grant mechanisms, SGP, uh, the inclusive conservation program that's just been launched by, by Jeff as well. You know, all of these have to be part of the equation for models for how to maximize the, not only the, in, the involvement, we, of, we often talk about involvement of civil society, of, of indigenous people, but we really want to start to get to the empowerment because there's been so much emphasis on how indigenous people, how local communities are better stewards of land management uh, than others. How can we have them and their solutions be part of the equation? So this, uh, this is part of what the DGM is trying to do. I think it's part of what um, 
uh, the small grants program has been doing 26,000 grants, I think Filippo said, over its lifetime. Um, so thinking about perhaps how we together can collaborate, can synergize, can think of these models uh, to get them out there, to have a voice, and as a means to channel additional financing to these places where they need it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. And it's great to see that, you know, institution like World Bank through the Climate Investment Fund is uh, working on this space and providing that needed support led by indigenous peoples and working together. And as you mentioned, I think there is a lot of synergies between these programs and we can work together. It's exciting to have Iki small grants here as well and we can further that. We also have other partners in small grants program like Australian government, Japanese government, German governments and also other foundation who are really interested in working on local solutions and local climate solutions and see what we can do from the bottom up. And this is a very needed initiative at this point when we really need to address the, the dire need for climate crisis, addressing those. So by this, uh, I'd like to really open up for questions and comments. Um, maybe we can facilitate uh, bringing the mic to your um, place. So please uh, raise your hand. And I see uh, the lady in the middle. Um, oh. oh, yes. <laughs> Maybe uh, the 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 person in the middle. Uh, can you raise a hand? The, you 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 put your hand first um, next to next to you. Thank you, lady. I was I am Bakesek from Senegal. I am a French speaker. My English is not very good, but I try to talk when I have to try. I was here two days two days ago. And I want to talk about small grant. In our country, climate crisis make grow up the problems. Population grow ups. Why small grant don't grow up? We don't know. In 20 last 20 years, small grant is so small. And we have financial crisis. We have war in Ukraine. We have COVID-19. And people like me, all my life I'm working for sport, for soccer. And in my, in my city and in Dakar, we have a big problem of pollution. Small grant give me more skill. And 10 years after, I become the president of National Network Against Pollution and Environment. Small grant make me strong. But the, the, the grant is small. We need more money to train people like me and they have impact in climate crisis. My, my only target in this workshop to say small grant need to, to grow up. $15,000 $15, in this moment is not more money, but everything is go up in our country. And we need to train young people we need to train women, and we have more programs in climate crisis. Thank you very much. Um, um, je m'excuse pour mon anglais. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for my broken English. No. no, perfect intervention, and thank you very much. And, you know, it's really heartening to see a person who have grown with the grants, uh, small grants, and uh, making this intervention. And from my side, what we can say is that we do provide a phased approach of financing. Like, you know, the first phase could be more capacity development. And the next phase, we really do implementation. And the third phase, we scale up those work in other areas. So we've worked with like people like you who have nurtured our relationship over like 12 years, 15 years and more. And that's the way that we have been dealing with our small scale. But also, I really want to emphasize, like, now there is facility like Iki, or I think DGM is also going a little higher than 50,000 in certain uh, grants. I mean, there is a way to sort of scale up your intervention with other mechanism, too. And I really look, like to sort of emphasize that. Thank you again. And uh, the, the lady next to you, I think, on the... No, Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I thought the yes. I Hello, everyone. I am Fatima Tabakar Sisi from Sierra Leone, West Africa. 
I am Fatima Tabakaj to say from Sierra Leone, West Africa. My question goes to Nu. Um, I want to know um, how you manage young people. I like working with young people and I've been working with nature club in schools. I have about um, 120 nature club in my school whom I'm working with. My challenge is how to motivate the teacher coordinators. So my question to you is two. One is how do you motivate and maintain the cooperation of the teachers with regards to um, educating the people about environmental challenges and how to um, improve on that. And the second question is how do you manage the school curriculum with that of the activities of the young people so they don't um, like clash? How do you manage that? Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So, um, uh, teachers, how do I made them motivated? So, first of all, I had to make motivated schools, yes? And schools have directors. So, the motivation was the uh, heart component. So, uh, if they uh, pass all the road, yes, and they compete with their solutions, they could have this uh, investment. They could have this, for instance, uh, installation of solar PVs on their roofs or the roof insulation. So this was like motivating directors to uh, be in involved in this project. But teachers, usually this is an, an informal education, yes? Uh, it's not the formal one. So I had to somehow also to motivate teachers. Well, how I, did I do that? Uh, first of all, it was like an MOU with the school. If um, we are doing this project, you have to designate one teacher, and it has to be physics teacher in this project. Why physics? Because it is about energy, energy assessment, um, energy solutions, technology. That's why it was uh, physics teachers. And um, after, uh, with some empowering, um, uh, uh, meetings and events, these school children, uh, these uh, teachers felt themselves very like superheroes, you know? Uh, and they were motivated, they were uh, leading these green teams and they had the um, permission of the directors and they also had some small maybe uh, benefit from that, yes? Besides, besides the uh, motivating with the empowering uh, events. But uh, in the end, they grow in a way that they wanted to volunteer in that, you know? They wanted to uh, be heroes of these uh, school children. So in the end, uh, we succeeded. I can tell you more about that, but there are really some mechanisms that worked. Yeah, and the second question was about the school activities, competing activities. Yes. So these competitions we have t uh, we have designed in a way that it was really transparent. Everyone knew the uh, scoring system how it is, and whenever there was a, an issue, we were solving this in a participatory way. Yes. And in the end, these teams were kind of satisfied with the uh, scores. So even the school, uh, the green teams that uh, they lost in this competition, they were not uh, they uh, were not complaining because they knew that it is right. They didn't want that, and it was really transparent. And you know, I just want to add something. After uh, having these lessons learned, I understood that why I was thinking why the schools uh, they lost. I understood that there was an issue with the uh, quality of the uh, knowledge transfer. Yes, and now we are with small grants project. We are doing this green ebook, which is a online course of um, starting from earth systems to climate change adaptation and mitigation technologies in order to have this. Uh, standardized uh, models for uh, children and not only yeah thank you that was really a good question and great answers um, thank you um, we'll take uh, another question from here Yoko 
Hi, Yoko. Yoko, he wants to, he wants to add to that response, yeah. Okay. Je veux parler en anglais au Sénégal. Um, scaling up of good uh, local practices uh, will be done mainly through financial instruments. As uh, IKEA uh, Small Ground are doing, uh, we can uh, use all opportunity we have with uh, uh, adaptation fund and green climate fund to scale up because you say that population are growing and then uh, I think that um, uh, 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 all climate change must be integrated into the planning and budgeting system of local governments. Uh, community monitoring and evaluation tool will be strengthen the impact of local action and the uh, accountability of uh, actor in line with new decentralization measure adopted by the government to strengthen local budgeting and the financial performance of uh, municipalities. Thus, the instrument that can facilitate the promotion of local uh, initiative are um, programming of investment, for example, estimate of the cost and benefits of adaptation option, multi-criteria analysis and selection of priority measures, development of uh, annual investment program. And uh, it's necessary to establish to uh, uh, a mechanism for monitoring investment uh, in the municipality. Um, to conclude, I can say peer uh, learning and knowledge sharing through uh, municipal and national forum is necessary to scale up a good practice of local uh, investment as uh, IKI are doing, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that additional input. It's very, very useful. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. Um, maybe we'll take uh, two at a time so that we can answer um, um, with the panel. So over to Thank you. Uh, Uh, my name is Claudia and I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'd like to share an experience that we have, uh, more than a question, but I think it's helpful. Uh, I work in a Brazilian fund, Casa Socio Environmental Fund, and we support grassroots organizations, uh, traditional groups, indigenous, quilombolas, fishermen, and uh, the way we work is in the logic of philanthropy for social justice, which means that we put the money uh, in a strategic way on the hands of our grantees. We didn't uh, develop projects. They are. So uh, are more than 3,000 projects in almost 18 years that we, we did. So most of them work in partnership. We, uh, we like this way to, to work and we also help organizations in other countries to create local funds and uh, which are already did in Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru and Mozambique and uh, it works. The results are amazing and we are so happy and would like to share our this material with the organization of this activity and you can find this in our website and casa casa dot org dot br thank you very much um, conservation fund like yours is a similar also mechanism and thank you so much for that intervention uh, thank you my name is Kenneth 
I'm from Uganda. Uh, my concern is uh, we come here to connect with you people. So after sessions like this one, we exchange cards, numbers, social media handles, and leave. We have projects, we have ideas, and the reason we come here is to access you people. But after here, we write mails, you don't reply. You send hi on WhatsApp, I'm Kennedy from Uganda, doing this, just blue ticking. My humble request. After here, help us gain out of these sessions. Help us gain out of the conversions. Let us embrace the chance that we get to meeting you people. It's not easy. Some of us where we come from, there are people who got badges. So one of my friends, I told him, are we leaving tomorrow? He said, you know what, guy? This time I'm not going to cop. I met so many people last time, and none of them responded to my mails. Guys, I kindly request that this time when you get our calls, somehow see how you respond. All, you may not be the concerned person, but you can direct me through that mail that contacts so-and-so in this office. Thank you so much. Hi, I have a quick question. I'm from Costa Rica, and I wanted to know about the funding that you are offering, if it's also for core funding. As organizations, usually we have a lot of consultants, and for growing up and scaling up our work, we also need to know if we can invest in the people that we are contracting, and if we can uh, make like our team grow to make sustainable our work. So I wanted to know if in the different options that you have, if you have a core funding for organizations. Thank you. Okay, let me uh, take uh, the two questions since it's directly kind of com coming to small grants. Um, the first question, yes, we do have country presence. As you may know, we have a small grants program in Uganda. And um, we can have a chat after this, and we can definitely link you up with our national coordinator. And please do present your ideas and innovation, and we really look forward to hearing on that. Um, the Costa Rica lady, in terms of uh, core funding is concerned, I mean, we do fund definitely to initiate that initiative on the ground. Uh, we do understand that you do need technical assistance. You do need a staff to work on that, and we do fund uh, sort of certain percentage of the project to make sure that those parts are uh, addressed. And also, we also understand that that is really important for the sustainability of your institution. So, of course, there is a limit of um, certain ratio that we support, but, uh, you know, we always discuss about it when we get the proposals in hand, what is the most appropriate sort of cost we can cover. Um, yeah, maybe Iki um, and Small Grants, if you have some feedback on that, it would be really helpful. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, just adding to that, Iki um, has project funding, so we don't have core funding per se, but we do also fund overhead costs as part of the projects. Um, so I think that that should help make it, uh, make it more sustainable. And then just uh, briefly uh, to the question from the gentleman from Dakar. Um, I think uh, when it comes to projects getting bigger, uh, Yoko and I chatted before uh, the session started and, and realized that the, the small grants program that Jeff offers is up to $50,000, uh, I guess, whereas Iki starts from, uh, from 60000 and goes up to 200000 And then Iki also has a medium grants program in addition to the small scale uh, small grants program that then goes up to I believe 800,000 so I think that's a nice kind of graduation and then we do also offer um, some institutional um, support as part of our small grants program where um, I think I mentioned that before GIZ also offers capacity building to organizations uh, to administer the funding 
um, but also to administer their own small-scale programs. And as part of that, for instance, uh, GIZ is also supporting um, the National Development Bank of Botswana, I believe, in developing a gender strategy, because in, in that case, that was identified as one of the main uh, challenges to become accredited to the GCF. So, uh, so we do offer that kind of support. We have also, uh, in the past, we also supported a GCF readiness program. Now GCF has their own readiness program. So I think there are funding opportunities out there, but I'm definitely always interested uh, to learn if, if these are insufficient uh, for whatever reason. Um, yeah, but, but I, just, uh, I just wanted to mention that as well. Thank you. So actually, I have a question to Miriam, if, if you don't mind. Uh, I've been always wondering why GIZ doesn't work in environment in Egypt. This is actually, yeah, yeah. I think you are very active in the field of uh, education, and some, but I know, I know for sure, for example, for nature conservation in particular, there is no any active program for GIZ Egypt even though you are very active in the North Africa and, uh, Mediterranean, uh, and uh, Middle East, but not in Egypt. So this is really bothering me. So <laughs> Please well, do, yeah. Okay. I, I don't actually know. I know that in our development cooperation, there's always priority areas, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on development cooperation Egypt. But I'll... Thank you. Um, I think there are two questions on the other side, and we can take those and start wrapping up. Before, before that, um, to the panelists, to wrap up in the end, I'd like to ask each of you to sort of talk about, to in further scale up small grants kind of mechanism. What is your one recommendation? How we can expand this more? Uh, what is your recommendation for approaches? So think about it while we take these uh, um, questions moving forward. Okay, uh, thank you so much. My name is Reda Ahmadine. I'm uh, the program assistant of the Small Grants Program in Egypt. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, actually, I have a question and I have a reflection on some of what uh, have been said. Uh, for the IKI uh, uh, um, uh, funding, is it, uh, is it open for uh, all the countries? Uh, is it open for NGOs only uh, in all the countries or not? This is a question. Um, I have a reflection on uh, what have been said about the uh, the uh, uh, the synergy between the uh, GF uh, projects, the full size projects, and the small grants uh, program uh, funded project. Actually, we have a unique experience in Egypt uh, for that because uh, we 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 have experienced that this is a win win situation. Uh, actually, uh, when we complement uh, and coordinate between the small grants program and the full-size projects implemented, uh, the, the full-size project, they provide the technical assistance to the, to the uh, NGOs, and the NGOs contribute as well on, uh, to, on how to uh, mainstream the, uh, the full-size project among the local communities and increase the visibility of the full-size projects among the local communities. And we have done that with the sustainable transport, with the biogas projects, and with the uh, um, solar energy projects, and so on. And we have very, very successful experience. This is one thing. Another, another thing about the, uh, uh, the, <coughs> and the other uh, funding mechanisms, for example, like the EU mechanism uh, um, for funding uh, and, and other, uh, uh, or other organizations as well. Actually, uh, uh, they have found that the small grants uh, mechanism for funding is very successful. So we had several experiences in Egypt that the EU have funded and using the small grants program mechanism through the, the, the funding mechanism, the monitoring and evaluation mechanism, which is very effective. So it encourages other uh, donors to use the same mechanism as well. And we have a very successful experience uh, uh, funded by the EU in Egypt uh, with more than uh, uh, 1.7 million uh, euros uh, um, implementing more than uh, 80 uh, projects uh, uh, in, in Upper Egypt using the small grants program mechanism. So this was very uh, uh, important as well. Um, I emphasize on what Khalid has mentioned about the capacity building. Uh, we, we try uh, through the program 
to, to have uh, capacity building for the project management, the financial management, and so on. But we need more uh, capacity building standalone uh, projects to, uh, uh, to reach out to more uh, uh, NGOs, not only the SGP grantees, but to uh, expand this to other NGOs to benefit and increase the benefit as well. Um, concerning the innovative ideas, uh, I think uh, uh, we, we had a, a, a new approach on linking the NGOs to the academia, to the universities and the research centers and so on to gain the experience and to know more and more about innovative ideas that can be uh, uh, developed into uh, projects. Uh, uh, so I think this, this was a good approach and we are going to keep it as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Gada, for sharing that uh, experience from Egypt. And as uh, maybe others recognize, um, Gada and Imad has been the power here um, managing the small grants in Egypt. Um, will we take uh, one more question here and then over there? Thank you. Uh, my name is Abdi. I'm from Somalia. Uh, and small uh, grants program is very important for the supporting technically and financially for the local organizations and civil society. In Somalia, we have a lot of civil society organizations, and they we haven't seen any uh, small grants that uh, an organization that get benefited from uh, these grants. So we would like to know: Is there any projects going on in Somalia, or how can uh, those organizations can benefit for this grant? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is Asif from uh, Asian Development Bank, Pakistan Resident Mission. Uh, just two quick suggestions. I mean, I can write to the GCF and JEP people in details. Uh, I mean, first is accreditation of some other entities. In Pakistan, we only have two entities registered, the UNDP and ADB. And we are over occupied on our projects and usually couldn't handle some time the grants. The second is basically, the project officer, I'm vocal point for climate change. I, I love to push the climate resilient agenda, but my co-project officers are not in, in the favor because this, I mean, their mindset is the GCF and JEP operations are more cumbersome. They require a lot of, for example, if you accredited someone, this means you had accredited, you had accredited all, all the financial and the procedures. So this, this, yeah, uh, just, like this okay so this means if you accredited someone then you you satisfy with the processes of of the entity so i mean financial requirement and the project processing requirement should be less so the project officers and the people who handle the project should be attractive toward the gcf and jeff and not reluctant currently they are reluctant they are not basically in a position to take more money along with a hundred million dollar of a one million dollar grant and this is because of the cumbersome process for example in one of the project we are implementing biogas uh, for the buses and 50 million dollar has been handed over from the gcf uh, 10 million dollar is grant but the the situation is now that uh, uh, the gcf want that we spend the money first and once the project complete then they will be reimbursed so this kind of situation should be overcome please Thank you. Uh, my name is Amutumavazi Innocent. I'm from Uganda, from the oil region. Uh, one of the challenges that we, ha we normally get is um, releasing the funds very late. I think if you have a program of like providing seedlings to, to community members to plant, it's better you agree with the sub grantee so that you release the money in time. So sometimes people get the, tree, the seedlings, when they plant them, then they dry out. Because the season, uh, you release the money when the season is ending. That is one of the challenges. Then the other, uh, another issue is uh, a colleague um, from uh, uh, Khalid eh, talked about uh, <laughs> giving uh, capacity building for the institutions. But I think even um, to the leaders, uh, the government institutions, because I've seen in my country 
find it's the government leasing out uh, wetlands and uh, forests to investors. So I think they also need some capacity building. Um, any takers on the questions or comments? Thank you. I just briefly wanted to, uh, to respond to the question from the lady here in, in the first row um, on whether icky small grants um, or whether all countries are eligible for icky small grants. And yes, all countries that are eligible for official development assistance are also eligible for icky, icky small grants. Um, and it's always civil society, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for clarifying that. Um, let me also answer on the Somalia gentleman's question. We are actually starting program in Somalia very soon. We had um, a conversation with the government as well as civil society. So Somalia is next in line to start up. So we'll look forward to talking with you. Um, gentleman from the ADB, um, we are talking about small grants. So basically, uh, we're talking about how we can mobilize civil society and others. These are um, entities that are not necessarily need to be accredited per se. Uh, we are providing funding from the GEF side, the ICI side, uh, the World Bank, who have the small grant mechanism directly to the civil society. Um, and lastly, the gentleman on you, you have a very good point regarding uh, working um, in a way directly with the local communities. So well, that's what uh, many of our program do, so that the person who, I mean, the communities who are on the ground will take care on the planting of the trees or regeneration of the forest, so that uh, it's not sort of going through layers of middle person or others, and that's where we really feel that our programs really generate to sustainability. So. Those are sort of some of the clarification that I can provide. So just to wrap up, I would um, ask each of you, just maybe 30 seconds, one sort of recommendation, hearing all these comments and questions, in order to further strengthen or scale up the small grant mechanism, what is your suggestion? What can we do to strengthen, scale up the small grants? So starting from... Uh, Andrea, to please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think that to scale up, scale up uh, small grant program, um, peer to peer learning via uh, South Africa collaboration issues, best practice are picked and upscaled. Capacity building, enhancing skills, knowledge, and expertise so that the implementers and decision makers ensure uptake of recommendation. Uh, policy, a key and such initiative must be maintained in national and sub-national plan and strategies. Great. Thank you so much, Apollinaire. I mean, I asked one, Com one recommendation, so I think you're Co ready. Community members, community members, involvement is a process. Innovation, stakeholder, involvement, enabling the end user community member to make decision. Own the process and get empowered lead to life-changing, sustainable project. Thank you. Thank you, Apollinaire. Katarina, your suggestion. Um, is it a suggestion to you or to further grantees? OK, just <laughs> to everybody. So um, I think that those, um, those organizations and communities that are more in need of these um, grants, small grants, usually don't have the access to these spaces or um, or have more difficult access to these spaces with donors, with, uh, uh, with the philanthropists. And I think um, just fostering that uh, exchange and like gathering uh, in different regions and, and countries um, would really help to scale up this kind of programs, I think, um, just because 
it's not in the radar for many for many people. And then on the kind of institutional side, I think um, I cannot agree with Khaled enough. Like, it's so important to maybe um, include a very like uh, a, a larger share of of grants towards um, or, or uh, sorry to to be able to direct a larger share of the grants to capacity building. So to really sustain you know like the 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 people that are working on the projects and that could eventually uh remain in the projects to to really uh eventually receive the um, middle grants uh and you know like grow with the organization so yeah those are my two my two cents thank you thank you katarina um now to miriam uh, thank you uh i think uh, i don't want to repeat it but um but I, I do really think that that combination of project uh, support and capacity building is hugely important just to maximize the impact beyond the project in itself. Great. So even though it's a repetition, I think it's, it's also a bit, a bit of a consensus between us. Yes. Um, going forward, Filippo? Um, for me, I, mean, I see a, an opportunity as countries start um, putting together the long-term strategies for, um, uh, for climate change on a mitigation and adaptation to, to, to try and create a link between the work at community level and the work that the domestically is being done by the government in a sort of coherent and coordinated way so that all of these small initiatives can be directed in the same direction and rowing together with a, with a, with a kind of national level government strategy. I think if we find a way of doing that, we can see mutually beneficial benefits going from top to down and from down to up. Great, thank you so much, Filippo. Now to Khaled. Yes, actually I think uh, yeah, particularly about this uh, idea or suggestion, it's very tricky to be honest because I personally experience somehow like Let's admit it, like the environmental protection discourse is being produced in the West or in the global North. And it's not necessarily respond to the global Taos ideas and perception and priorities. So from one side, I support working within a strategy, but from the other side, it's really tricky when we develop a global strategy to break it down to something that makes sense to every day's life of non-Western or the global South. Of course, this is a very big topic, but uh, I don't think I have time to talk about this, but we really suffer from this. Like, we have to use specific terminology. We have to propose working within a specific uh, domain that could be appealing to the Western ear, but not necessarily making sense to everyday life in Egypt. No, I think uh, it's very clear in terms of localization as well as understanding the local context. Now to noon. So I was sitting here and reading this small grants program and was thinking, it's not small, it's big. So how we make small big? It is several ways. One is bottom-up approach, as you talked. It is kind of making the solutions, succeeded solutions, like beneficiary solutions, yes? And then they are becoming an agent of change, and it goes from bottom to up. And other way is the top-down, that is integrating small grant project innovation to government-led project and policies. And uh, we succeeded also in this, and it's always good coming from top down and uh, bottom up and then going from top down. And the third way, it is like communicating the results using ICT tools, yes, digital tools, digitalizing the knowledge and making it uh, accessible for all. This is how I see the scaling up. And yes, small is big, I think, in, Thank your, you. in this context. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, all the panelists made my closing remark easier. They all highlighted all the very important points of how we can scale up 
and strengthen the small grants program and the different small grant initiatives around the world together. And lastly, I re just really want to emphasize that partnering with all these different mechanisms really also build up a strength, strong sort of mechanism to reach out to all the local communities and actions. So I hope you really enjoyed today the um, how important these reaching out for local climate solution can be and how that can be impactful to reach the goal that we all adhere towards. So thank you very much, and I really look forward to uh, further uh, having a dialogue with all of you. Thank you very much for the panelists today for this really insightful and amazing interaction. And thanks to my team who have built this uh, really space together with GF and GCF Pavilion here. So thank you so much. <laughs>